Is the West ready for Ukraine's victory plan and the end of Russia? Volodymyr Orisko, diplomat, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine in 2007-2009, and head of the Center for Russian Studies. Volodymyr, glory to Ukraine. Glory to the heroes. Volodymyr, did you have a feeling after the presentation? The Victory Plan is ready to be accepted politically, but also realistically, by all our partners to whom we have already presented it, and will continue to do so. Since it was already presented by President Zelensky a little earlier in September, when he was at the UN General Assembly, I think it was not a surprise to our partners. They already knew it. Now, most likely, it is finalized and will be submitted with these additions. I think that this should be the focus of all the main work of Ukrainian diplomacy in the broadest sense of the word. Because this is the job of the president, the chairman of the Verkhovna Rada, the Verkhovna Rada itself, the cabinet of ministers as an institution, and each minister in particular, and so on, including the public, of course, and journalism, of course. That is, our national task now is to convince our partners that Ukraine's victory in the war is not only a victory for Ukraine, but a victory for the entire democratic world. And so it is in the interests of our partners. Although to tell you frankly, there will undoubtedly be skeptics, useful idiots on the Kremlin's payroll, agents of the Kremlin's influence, and so on and so forth. They will work to minimize the importance of this plan as much as possible. But as they say, we have to do our part. You are more than right, Mr. Volodymyr, but if they can find something, they have already found it. And Julian Ripke is known for his ambiguity, so to speak. A German analyst for the Bild magazine says that there will be no NATO membership, no permission to strike deep into Russia, no Western weapons, no joint air defense against Russian aviation, and no mention of complete liberation of the country. He has no words, and I have, of course, and I think we have as well, to answer him, and not only him. Do I understand correctly that we are really facing new challenges now? And yes, perhaps tomorrow all this will not happen, as Rupka says. But in parts, in stages, in a certain periodization, we, together with our allies, will move towards implementation by persuasion, maybe a little bit of blackmail, especially diplomatically. What should I say to him about this all is lost? Ripke is an interesting man who tries to analyze the situation from multiple perspectives, but he is seriously mistaken here. If he had looked back at what was said at the start of the war about no tanks, no Abrams, no HEMARS, and no Patriots, he would see that now we have all of it, including F-16s. There are political parties for this, there is a government, there is a federal chancellor, in short, a whole bunch of people who, according to their obligations, have to fulfill them. Rupke can describe certain things, but making such predictions is very risky for his own reputation. But he has already done it, and it will remain on his reputation. At the same time, Juliana Smith, the U.S. representative to NATO, says that we will not see an invitation to NATO in the near future. But how long is this soon? What needs to be done to remove the last fears of our partners? Or what is left for them to do to simply not issue an invitation? 
Ce ta nu alergi și străbuc, ne vor repita și cei bude să lușate să pocușe. Văd nu așa ce Giulia Mesmir, că tac prin stărnește și a prin nată pază și o negri și așa, să nu-mi te proșe de nată și te tăte ne baci te. No one is saying that tomorrow we will become a full-fledged 33rd member. Although, of course, this is not the case. What do people fear even further? How can we break this fear? And will such an invitation, if it is finally voiced, show the Kremlin that they have been rubbed the wrong way and that there are no red lines anymore? I am not surprised that the representative to the United States and NATO said this, and I will explain why. Because the U.S. elections have now reached their final stretch, and now every word, every step, every gesture of the Democrats will be under the huge magnifying glass of the Republicans. The Republicans have long since ridden this horse that they are for peace and the Democrats are for war. Before November 5th, there will be no statements from the U.S. administration. For example, Biden announces he will meet with the leaders of Britain, France, and Germany. They'll consult and come to the conclusion that we will allow Russia to be hit for 300-500 kilometers. At that very second, Mr. Trump will simply give Biden a standing ovation because he will say, well, look at what this. And then in Trump's style, he will characterize Biden. You see, he's pushing us toward a world war. He wants a world war tomorrow. Because Ukrainians will certainly take advantage of this permission, and what will Russia do? It will launch a nuclear strike, and the apocalypse will begin. You see, you don't need to be an academic to understand this. That's why I predict that the American administration will not say anything of this type. Perhaps, if there is a meeting between Zelensky and the four leaders in Berlin on Friday, because Zelensky is flying to Brussels tomorrow and will present the plan to the European Council there, then if there is a meeting in the 4 plus 1 format in Berlin, it is quite possible that the leaders of these four states will say so quietly in his ear. You'll have to wait another three weeks until the fifth. I recently heard a high-ranking official refer to strategic patience. That's what we all need. Some say fatigue was evident on Zelensky's face when he presented his victory plan to the Verkhovna Rada. Vladimir, have you seen these plans? Which do you consider the fastest, most realistic, and most important to implement? Do all the components contribute to the puzzle of strategic patience and victory? You know, for me, the most important point was, and still is, point number two, although it should have been point number one. But I think we specifically put the NATO thesis first, so that it would be the political part, so to speak, and so that we would not be accused of demanding only weapons. We have already discussed this. This is what will show. Goodbye. We will not even discuss this topic anymore. Ukraine will be in the alliance. But in order for it to be in the alliance, we need to defeat Russia.
Russia can only be defeated on the battlefield. Even today, they are howling and cheering and saying that it is all a disaster, that Ukraine will never rise again, and so on. Well, actually, what did we expect from these swamp frogs who croak there? They cannot say anything other than what they have said a thousand times. Everything is clear here. But what I miss in this plan is point number six. What should happen to Russia after our victory? Because he leaves this question open, unfortunately. Our partners need to get used to the idea that there can be no such Russia anymore. Because, if we assume that we have won, expelled the bandits from Ukrainian territory, and that's the end of it, then excuse me, where are the war criminals being punished? And where are the payments for the damage caused to us, which is hundreds of billions of dollars? And where is the rationalization of Russia? It's demilitarization, denuclearization. If we want the bear to be finally beaten, then it must be brought to the appropriate state. And if we say, all right, you Ukrainians have won back your territory, we are taking you to NATO, we are taking you to the EU, and that's the end of it, we will get this dragon again in five to seven years and no more. This is definitely true. We need responsibility for all articles and points. Implementation. The tasks have been outlined and we will work, Vladimir. The Kremlin, of course, is also stable, and this is no longer funny, because they are war criminals. They say that all this is futile, but the Kremlin is worried. What do you think? Not only Peskov, but Zakharova has already jumped up and down with her statements. You know, I'm waiting for the anti-sac to dissipate. What will he write? Because it will be epic. Dry, uniform words and sentences are already somehow bland and uninteresting. I'm just waiting to see what this drunken miracle worker will write. Well, Miss Irina, we just need to finally stop listening to what is pouring out there, because it is a stream of crazy consciousness that seems to be worthless to respond to. Well, what can we expect from people who live in a parallel reality, who are out of their minds and think that they are ahead of the rest of the world? Let's wait and see. But everything there is stable in its madness. The whole planet, well, let's wait and see. But in my opinion, everything is stable there, stable in its own madness. So we shouldn't be offended by sick people and pretend that we are condemning them. Of course, this is obvious, but, but if a person is sick, well, then he is sick. But, well, the diagnosis is obvious. At the same time, these patients are uniting, the gangsters. This cartel is gathering, Russia, China, and Kim Jong-un, who has revived. Thanks to him, Putin obviously hopes to revive his occupation army. What do you see behind this cooperation, Mr. Volodymyr? How far can they go, and what do they expect? Iran is not giving up either. This is very sad. When I read the reactions of our American partners to what is happening, 
it is really abnormal. This form of statement without further practical steps leads the democratic world to a dead end. It is impossible to simply say that if North Korean troops are involved in Ukraine, it will intensify the conflict. This is clear to a child. We need to respond to this and act accordingly. It is said that America breathed a sigh of relief when Israel announced that it would not attack Iran's nuclear facilities. Perhaps, from the point of view of the pre-election situation, this is a relief because there will be no need to respond. But is it in America's interest for Iran to become a nuclear power? Of course not. You have an ally who says, I will eliminate this problem. So applaud an ally who can help you. Allow Israel to do what you cannot or do not want to do. The same goes for Ukraine. Give Ukraine the opportunity to do what you cannot. And if this opportunity is not given, then this whole network of gangster regimes certainly shrugs its shoulders. The axis of evil is beginning to spread around the world. This is what our dear partners need to think about, and not just say that they are once again alarmed. We must act. German Chancellor Schultz said, we need to act. I will speak at the EU summit to get more aid to Ukraine. And then he adds, and we can talk to Putin, but only about a just peace. Putin does not want this peace at all, but Schultz is not averse to talking. This statement is the fourth in two months. Talk about what? And most importantly, why? And I think, Irina, in order to show themselves as peacemakers, a large part of the Social Democrats' electorate in Germany is for peace. They are against everything bad, for everything good, at the expense of Ukraine, at the expense of Ukrainians, at the expense of making peace with the aggressor and giving it part of the territory. Why not? It's very convenient. Here's to world peace. Unfortunately, this thesis is more than popular with the Social Democrats. What does the leader of the Social Democrats do when his support, not only personal but also that of the party itself, is going down? He has to look for some kind of a lifesaver on which he can raise his percentages, which are falling quite a bit. Here is Schultz, a peacemaker, a peace lover, a Schultz who talks even to the devil, if only there is peace. In the eyes of those who do not think, who simply consume some slogans, he is doing a useful thing. Accordingly, his shares are rising. Vladimir, it's good to model that even if they talk, it won't work. Our plan of victory will not be realized as quickly as we would like. How can Israel wait and not attack Iran's nuclear or oil facilities? 
kontaktam Iranu, i to oni kažu te roblje trećite više, mi se ne koji mi s tim radi spustiti sad Amerika. They always do more than the U.S. advises them to do, but still, North Korea will not ask anyone, and it will want to, and will be able to attack South Korea, and maybe not only. Irina, it's true that this is no longer a theory, but maybe a practice. Because unlike other chains of this axis of evil or the axis of war, the level of political madness and perhaps physical madness has already gone beyond all possible and impossible limits. And here, if there are armed clashes, if North Korea starts using force, then the Americans cannot but react. They are bound to South Korea by a security treaty and must protect South Korea from all possible risks. And here too, I think that these statements by today's crazy North Korean dictator that 1.5 million young men are ready to take up the holy fight against the pagans from the South are not accidental. These are also, after all, parts of the same chain, because the Kremlin today needs to set fire to everything it can to make Americans nervous. In the last three weeks before the election, they are trying to raise the topic of world war to the maximum and make sure that Americans will certainly react somehow. But they will react, of course, in a way that is clear in the event of an attack on South Korea. So I think that all of this is orchestrated from one center. You know that they signed some kind of agreement on a comprehensive strategic partnership, military assistance, and so on. So I think that this North Korean dictator is simply being fed ideas that he is verbally announcing, at least for now. So I think it's not a coincidence, it's a general line of the Kremlin to destabilize the situation in the United States, to quarrel. Not only to quarrel, but also to simply throw a huge stone at the age of the Democrats, creating problems for them with their voters. This is in order to give an advantage to Trump, with whom Putin apparently has a special mental and psychological connection, or deviation, or something like that. Mr. Volodymyr, do you think that this conductor, who orchestrates wars around the world, is sitting there now and thinking that he is succeeding in many ways, or is there still something he is afraid of, perhaps some internal challenges? It is clear that he is afraid of one thing, his own skin. He is afraid that the situation may get out of control. He is afraid of everything around him. And first of all, and we have already talked about this, Irina, he is afraid that in some place his rotten imperial fabric may simply begin to crack. We are studying this Russia, but it is really very difficult to predict where it will start to tear apart. Look, who would have thought that a banal topic about redistribution of property could turn into an inter-ethnic conflict? You are a provider. I mean, you are sharing the skin of a rather big bear. They say something about $7 billion. These are not small amounts. But how did this seemingly completely economic issue suddenly become a very political and serious one? How two neighboring nations are beginning to prepare for an armed struggle. And imagine what will happen in the Caucasus if two adjacent subjects of the Federation start to sort things out. There are still a lot of seemingly small but very painful issues there, such as the border. At some point, there were decisions that were in favor of one republic to the detriment of the other, and it went on and on. It is no accident that Kadyrov speaks of blood revenge. 
For you and me, this is more or less a theoretical concept, but for the peoples of the Caucasus, it is actually very serious. I was told by some people from there that they live by Sharia law first, and only then by all the other laws. If, God forbid, blood is shed and it turns into a small armed chica, the Caucasus could erupt in such a way that even the Valdai residents would be warm. Well, the Caucasus can be so hot that even the Valdai residents will be warm. I like this forecast. Piskov, it always seems to me, makes statements when he is afraid of certain situations. And today, Piskov is commenting on the situation with Kadyrov, blood feuds, and the fact that he was allegedly assassinated, which means that the Kremlin has no plan to regulate this and how to put it out, where to get those fire extinguishers when it starts to burn. Obviously, you can see that Kadyrov didn't actually challenge the leadership at all. It's just an outer shell. His arrow flew to the Kremlin because he did not go to Putin for some reason to consult. True, he got on his own plane and flew to Saudi Arabia. And what was he doing there? Poor guy. Apparently, he was also hanging out with someone there and telling them that Muslims are generally looked down upon, that true Muslims need to take all this into account, need to unite, look for ways to support each other, and so on. I think this is a challenge for Putin. I don't know how he will respond, most likely in the same way as they did with the loser Puchest, who was marching on Moscow. But it will be more difficult because there was an obvious bandit who was under investigation. And the whole Kadyrov bandit clique is a little bit different. Kadyrov has his own army in Chechnya, albeit a small one, maybe not quite heavily armed, but it's not like Kar Prigozhin marching on Moscow with two or three military units. Moreover, the Chechens don't have to go anywhere. They will simply declare independence. It will have a domino effect, you know. Now the situation there is escalating, and this, I think, is Putin's biggest headache if we talk about internal issues. We have discussed the external ones. If we manage to further unite this external political front against Russia, the chances for the Russians and for Putin personally will be quite bleak. Events are heating up in the literal and figurative sense. Vladimir, thank you for the constructive conversation and your insightful points. I hope to see you again soon. Have a good day and goodbye. Thank you, Vladimir Ohrisko, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine and head of the Center for Russian Studies. Friends, thank you for spending this time with us.
I hope you found this useful. If so, please like this conversation and write your comments. I'm sure you definitely have something to say about the topics we discussed. Subscribe to Channel 24 YouTube. Take care of yourself and believe in the armed forces of Ukraine. See you and let's win.